Welcome back to our continuing series on the budget. And joining me today is Police Chief Tom Zenner from the Stevens Point Police Department. Tom, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so we're talking about budget um, and what our de departments do um, and what kind of value that the citizens get for the money that they pay in property taxes or whatever it happens to be. Most people understand the basics of the fire or the police department, rather, but you do a lot more. And let, let's talk about what the police department does and all the different facets of it. Sure. Uh, talking or bringing up what uh, you talk about, the most obvious is our patrol officers. It's also the uh, largest group of our employees within the department. We have nine, 29 officers that work patrol. But we also have uh, uh, our investigators. We have seven officers that work in our investigations bureau, uh, which we uh, cover everything from sensitive crimes, financial crimes. We have two officers that are assigned to drug uh, narcotics investigation. Uh, they're assigned to the uh, Central Wisconsin Multi-Jurisdictional uh, Enforcement Group. We've been part of that uh, group since, I, I'm going to take a shot at it, but about mid-90s. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, before my time when I came in. Uh, so we also have a community uh, resource officers. Uh, they respond. To, we have an administrative lieutenant that oversees our community resource officers, our crisis intervention officer, uh, court officers. Uh, and I can go in and, and describe some of that uh, a little later, but uh, we also have an operational lieutenant. Uh, that position oversees our auxiliary uh, officers, volunteer force that we have, the school resource officers. We have three school resource officers, uh, both junior highs and the uh, in SPASH and then also our training uh, program and uh, training cadre that we have. It is, it's, a, it's quite a bit more extensive than what most people think. Let's, let's break this down a little bit. When you have community resource officers, what do they do? Our community resource officers, uh, primarily their job is parking enforcement. That's, I would say, is where they're most visible. They also do uh, abandoned uh, bicycles. Uh, we'll pick up that. Uh, and in and I, I want to I want to jump in here real sure. quick because we get this a lot. When you talk about parking enforcement, nobody likes parking enforcement. But these people are just doing their jobs. The city council makes the ordinances, the parking ordinances, and that is based on a variety of things, whether it's safety or requests from uh, residents or businesses. Um, so. Cut them some slack. The the, the parking you. enforcement yes. officers are just doing what the enforcing the the ordinances that the council makes. I need right. to be clear on that because they get a bad rap a lot. They they do, and uh, they're doing a job that we assign them to. I assign them to, and that's based off of uh, the guidance that we get from uh, our our elders and what our ordinances are. Mm -hmm. And um, they do a, a very good job. They're dedicated to their job. And uh, I appreciate them. They're very good employees. Well, and it's more than just parking enforcement. They're an extra set of eyes out on the road because our patrol officers can't be everywhere all the time. They're in immediate radio contact with the comm center and the other officers. And they do other, um, I don't want to say less important, maybe less critical things like abandoned bikes. It, it amazes me the number of abandoned bicycles that we get. And then they pick them up, they put them, uh, they, they run the, the serial number if we happen to have a, a license on file. Um, but if someone loses their bike or the bike gets stolen, how can they you know, see if, if we have it in storage somewhere? Right, and, and that gives a great opportunity to talk about our city uh, registration. I think it's three, $3.25, and uh, it's a lifetime registration. What it helps with us, a bike is abandoned, it's stolen, we end up finding it anywhere within the city, it's a great opportunity or a way for us to track that bike and get it back to the owner. But our, our CSOs uh, will pick up those bikes. Actually, another duty they do, they assist with uh, community development, with some code enforcement. Uh, they're out at night, uh, again, different set of eyes and ears out on the street, and they're able to do some follow-up that we may not be able to do in the community resource uh, department. Yeah. We're able to do that, in, in particular on our nighttime CSOs. And you also have an auxiliary branch uh, that we started several years ago. Uh, talk to us about the volunteers 
that work in the auxiliary. Absolutely. We have, uh, I believe we're at 18 right now, and this is a fully volunteer uh, department, and uh, Lieutenant Jeremy Mueller oversees our auxiliary. Uh, we've uh, had our auxiliary, we must be on uh, pretty close to 10 years now. Uh, we have everything, actually we've hired several of our officers uh, off that auxiliary list uh, at the department. I know Portage County uh, Sheriff's Office has hired one. We actually have one of our auxiliary members that was uh, became uh, employed with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Oh, wow. So it's, uh, one, it's a great opportunity for us uh, to see some uh, people out there that may be going through school, uh, through the tech school or through the college uh, for a potential future hire. But we also have a good uh, portion of our auxiliary that uh, they just want to give something back to the community. Uh, they have no interest in becoming uh, going into law enforcement, and uh, they volunteer a significant amount of hours. They, uh, we've had them at homecoming up at SPASH this past weekend. Uh, they go to football games, uh, basketball, college, or... Uh, high school. Uh, most times you see them, they're going to be in around special events that are held within the city. That's part of our uh, process when people put in for uh, Parades, uh, special permits. street closings, making sure the intersections are safe. So there's right. a few perks to the job too. You know, you get oh, absolutely. Football games and, <laughs> and what have you. Uh, but yeah, we wouldn't be able to do half of the things that uh, we do here in the city without those volunteer auxiliary absolutely. officers. Let's talk a little bit more about the, the meat and potatoes of the department because you know, everybody thinks law enforcement, but there there's a lot of things that surround law enforcement. Uh, you know, we talk about the drug investigators at some point, but the one that I really wanted to touch on, because I think it's probably the root of a lot of the social problems that we have, is is mental health issues. And we have a dedicated mental health officer with specialized training that, that rotates. Talk about that. Right. Our, our crisis intervention officer is uh, Officer Mike Radzik. He's been in that position for uh, quite some time. The position, we went to a full-time position some years ago. The uh, Originally, that was Officer Christy Arns, mm -hmm. and uh, she remains very involved in uh, different programs, volunteering times with others. Uh, but Mike Radzik is in that position. He's a, a huge resource for us and the connections that he has with Salvation Army, Portage County Health and Human Services, and it is an increasing uh, call for service that we have dealing with individuals in crisis, whether uh, mental health or uh, potentially um, uh, substance abuse uh, tied into that. But uh, that position alone and just the, the resources that uh, are groups that, you know, come into the realm also with that, uh, I team, uh, you know, our, our aging population with some of the uh, medical concerns that come with that dementia and Alzheimer's. We have a program uh, called Operation Lifesaver that we are uh, partnered with. Uh, also, Portage County uh, Plover uh, PD is in this program. And that's basically individuals that are at risk. Uh, that have a, uh, it was initially called the Wanderers Program, I, I believe was the initial name, but where they may um, wander off, uh, may not have the resources to find their way home, they're outfitted, outfitted with a bracelet and we're able to track their whereabouts and uh, basically reunite them uh, back to their residence and uh, relative safety of their home. Yeah, and that can get really scary if you're, you know, if you know someone with dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, yes. where, where they just wander off and you are at a complete loss as to where they went um, and they don't necessarily have the, the mental capacity to understand the dangers uh, right. that they may be walking into. Uh, so that's, that's great that we have that. The other one that's always uh, intriguing is the school resource officers. I think SPASH is still the largest high school in the state, right? I believe so. Um, you know, so it makes sense that we have more of a connection with the students and teachers there. Talk to us about the school resource officers. Sure, Officer Joe Kramer is uh, the school resource officer, um, previously known as Police Liaison, if anybody went through the school and it sounds like a different name. That's the more uh, uh, common name now used for our school resource officers. So uh, Joe Kramer, uh, he's been at SPASH now five, six years. 
Uh, Officer Joel, Crane, uh, Joel Quizzler is at uh, uh, PJ's, and uh, Officer Chris Marshall just started his first year down at Ben Franklin. We've been, uh, Spash was our first school resource officer, and I believe that was uh, early 90s that that position uh, was created. And the two junior highs uh, joined, oh geez, 2005. Uh, 2006 and one it's a great opportunity for uh, our officers to interact uh, uh, and form you know connections not only with the uh, the staff at the schools but uh, students uh, I talked to several of our uh, uh, former uh, school resource officers and they still have, you know, people now well in their 30s, 40s coming up. Hey, you know, you were the <laughs> police liaison back in the day. So, uh, you know, it's a great connection that we can form there. But it also uh, assists the, the patrol officers with the amount of calls. I, I would think Spash or PJs and Ben Franklin all rank uh, well into the probably top five for calls for service within the the city, mm -hmm. and instead of having a patrol officer need to respond to those particular calls, we have somebody on staff already that can handle that and work with the school uh, within their um, you know policies that they have. So it's not just you know immediately going to the enforcement aspect. Sure. And so um, the next group uh, that I want to talk about is the investigation bureau, and uh, you know I know just. Several years ago, uh, three or four years ago now, we started doing uh, more electronic or cyber crime type things where we can, you know, pull data and evidence off of cell phones or, or mobile devices, uh, computers, things like that, without giving away too much, obviously. Right. But let, let's talk a little bit about all of the resources that are necessary for an investigation bureau that covers everything. Absolutely, and thank you for bringing that up because that is becoming a growing cost in our budget, not only for the uh, technology that is tied in with this, uh, with technology and having a computer background yourself, obviously, uh, maintenance, annual maintenance fees. Uh, going off on just uh, an example of that, we're going to a new records management system uh, at a cost of $96,000, I believe, out of... Um, as a capital, with that, annually there's going to be a $21,000 maintenance fee. Yep. So all of these programs, <clears throat> excuse me, that are part of uh, our Investigations Bureau, uh, and I can give kind of a general idea, one of them is called Celebrate, uh, and that is assisting us in uh, collecting data off of uh, cell phones. That's pretty much um, our, our main um, Thing that we're looking at, I guess, for a lack of better terms. Uh, but a maintenance charge uh, for that service, not only are you paying the upfront cost, you're looking at $4,200 a year just to have that uh, software uh, availability to our detectives. Um, we have a couple other programs that we operate in there that assist us. Uh, the main focus right now we is, is moved away from um, personal computers, we did have a forensic investigator, but quite honestly, to be able to maintain that in our budget, mm -hmm. it just wasn't feasible when we could also get that service offered to us uh, through the state crime lab, sure. uh, Department of Criminal Investigations at the state level and the federal level. So where we have gone now is directed more towards um, cell phones, which frankly is more popular in the public too. Almost everybody's got one, That's right. right. And, uh, and nothing goes away anymore either. No, it don't. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's out there in, in cyberland, whether you're posting social media pictures or whatever. So, right. Uh, and we need to be able to access that on occasion for evidence. In uh, some of our other investigations, uh, in the complexities that come in, uh, uh, financial crimes, mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, one of our investigators that has been doing financial crimes for some time now, a detective, Kent Leepak. Uh, fantastic job in the knowledge that he has. Uh, it's second to none. What we've seen in our investigations uh, bureau now, though, that we have had a turnover, and um, some of our uh, newer officers that have gone in, uh, uh, Detective Stormy Garrett, uh, Detective Justin Klein, uh, those are two new detectives, uh, Detective Matthew Drossel, 
they've just rotated into our investigations bureau, I believe, in the last couple of years. Okay. With that uh, is a, a wealth of knowledge that has retired. Uh, we need to replace that, and that comes out of our budget for training. And uh, the department has uh, approximately $30,000 budget uh, just to handle annual training. And quite a bit of that here in the last two years has gone to those new investigators. Yeah. It isn't just a simple uh, you know, officer transferring in there. There's specialized investigations that they need, arson investigations, uh, to name one off the top of my head. Sure. And when it comes down to you know, money that you spend, a vast majority of your operating budget is salaries and benefits yes. for those officers uh, and, uh, and, uh, and your staff. But some of the capital things that people may not think about, uh, one I want to touch on are, you know, are the squads. Um, we replace those every couple of years, but they are literally in use 24-7. Um, I can't imagine sitting right. in the same chair for you know twelve hours a day. For, you know, it's, it's well, crazy. That you know, and that's it. We do a three-year rotation. We did do a two-year rotation. We have gone up to a three. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, when I talk to the general public or family members, and I'm discussing, yeah, we have a vehicle, and you know, it's starting to fall apart. It's three years old. Well, geez, you know, in most places, three years old. I still got two years left to pay on my my mortgage payment. Right. But. You don't reckon these vehicles are operating 24/7, running 24/7. Mm -hmm. uh, that three-year vehicle is probably more equivalent to about a 12-year vehicle uh, wear and tear. And you know, obviously, it's it's a shared vehicle uh, from officers. And uh, yeah, the inside they start getting pretty rough. It's like you might as well be sitting on a bleacher for 12, uh, 12 hours when it gets to being a... Yeah, getting in and out you know, with the utility belt and all the different pieces of equipment sure. that officers are required to carry or that need to carry um, and getting in and out of the vehicle, there's a lot of wear and tear. And of course, then you, know, you have the issues with um, chases, if those happen to, to come into play. Right. Um, those vehicles are used and, and quite honestly, they get beat up by the end of that three years. They're, they're in... Uh, Pretty oh, bad right. shape. And not only that, I mean, you're just looking at the vehicle that you're taking off the lot. Now you look at the specialized equipment that goes into a squad. I started here in 1994, and technology for me was a, was a radar gun. Yeah. And that was pretty much it. I mean, much less. I mean, we still use typewriters. We have officers here that we hire now. <laughs> they don't even know what a typewriter is. Yeah. So well, uh, That's the other thing, too. You know, the equipment that goes into not just the vehicles, uh, you know, but your offices, the, the computers, we use tough books. You can't use a, a regular laptop right. because they're, they're subject to some abuse. Uh, you know, they, they may go into a, uh, an active crime scene or, or something where they get jostled around. That, that just doesn't fly with your normal run-of-the-mill laptop computer. And they need oh, to right. be secure in the vehicle. Uh, you know, if, if you need to you know, take a corner or something, you don't want things sliding around. Not to mention all of the software that goes into that. I mean, you touched on that a little bit, uh, but just the records management. Boy, when the comm center calls, gets a call for a, a, a 911 for something, you need to know what you're getting into. Right. Whether it's, uh, you know, is this person have a history of violence or maybe mental health issues? Um, and without that record software and the accessibility of that, that puts the officers and the public in very dangerous situations. Oh, absolutely. That gives you a great heads up. What, what am I going to? Is this a frequent call for service? Or is it an individual that we may have a history with for, that is in crisis? And we have a crisis plan in place for of how best to respond to the needs of that individual in, in a moment that they need us most. And uh, we work very closely with Health and Human Services to develop the crisis plans. They have them in our communication center. So, right, if we end up getting dispatched to a call and it's an individual that we do have a history with and have this on file, it's going to have a very clear understanding of whatever officer it is. It's one thing when we're talking about Officer Mike Radzik, who's our crisis intervention officer, who has a, a, a great working relationship with many people in our community. It's, uh, you know, Officer... John you know, Doe at night that's responding has never dealt with this individual before. Now we have basically a game plan, written a crisis plan, a how, what, what's the best um, uh, tactic, so to speak, uh, to deal with this individual in crisis plan. What has what the crisis plan been designed for uh, and worked with that particular individual? So it, it, it's 
all of that gets dumped into our records management system. That and we you need use. to retrieve that soon. I mean, if, right. if there's a, it, the goal, of course, is to de-escalate. Exactly. Um, and if there are certain things that you can relate to um, that individual, we need to keep notes on that because right. that's going to help keep everybody safe, the officers, the, the person involved, the, the citizens uh, around it. So, And all of that costs money. Um, you know, we talk a little bit about you know, the, the things that you do and what you spend money on, and it's, it's all very important, and I hope the general public understands that, that, you know, uh, nobody wants to hang out with a police officer or see that the red light in the back of your windshield uh, or the back rear view mirror, but when you have the need to have emergency services respond, you want to make sure that they are well-trained, professional, and well-equipped to handle whatever situation might be thrown at them. And that's what we get with the Stevens Point Police Department and your piece of that Stevens Point budget pie. Uh, so we thank you for your service. Thank you and your team for everything that you do. And thank you. Uh, until next time, we'll, uh, we'll talk to you soon.